Thank you. Uh, I'm going to mix up the next panel just a little bit. Um, I'm going to have Dr. Blythe speak because I know he's got to teach a class, and I'm going to have him go first um, just to be sure. And then, Richard, I think I'm going to have you go right after him. It, it, would that be okay? And then, um, and then Jeff will do the summation on that one. This is the Open Education Resource Panel. And um, if you'll just, uh, you can just knock down those tags and put your tag up there if you've got your tent, tent card or whatever so we'll know who we're listening to. I just want to remind um, all the speakers, too, uh, if you'll go ahead and, and be seated on that front row uh, when your panel is the next to speak, just to be sure that we can make that transition really quickly. And, uh, and make sure, if you have not, to check in with Terry uh, to get your name, your tip card, so you can put it up on this front dais uh, area so we can see who we're talking to. Um, I don't know. Richard, did you get that? I want to, let's put yep. it up here just to be sure. Are you going to those all day? Yeah, I'll put them up here. No. Put yeah, it up here. I, I Dr. Blythe, would you get Richard's and stick it up here? Those. That'd be great. Yeah, put it up here because we can't see down uh -oh. there. That's the problem. This is the first one I've seen. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Why don't we keep our arrangement because I'm okay. My students will find <laughs> okay, well, I don't want to mess you up. So I actually coordinated this. So okay, great. Jeff actually is going to set us up. Perfect, perfect. You do what you need to do. I was just worried about your students. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is that a clicker? Flexible. 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 Are you ready? All right. Thank you. Madam Chair and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity for me to come back to Texas and talk with you about educating the digital generation. It was my good fortune to be able to work at TEA for 11 years, all of which were with some responsi responsibility for instructional technology and some of which with responsibility for curriculum, textbooks and assessment as well. And while technological in innovation has impacted virtually all the sectors of the U.S. economy, technology's effect on education has been mixed at best until the last few years. Change is definitely in the air, and the most prominent one, and maybe many would argue the most important manifestation of this change, is the shift from print, print to digital in instructional materials or content, Mrs. Miller. However, in, in this digital world, we can no longer look at instructional materials as a relatively isolated, discrete resource or budget item. If the shift from print to digital is to be effective, decisions about instructional materials need to be considered in context not only with the alignment to the TEKS, but also broadband, devices, access at home, and above all, professional learning. So I applaud your inclusion of technology directors, along with superintendents and instructional materials coordinators in this roundtable. And while I was daunted, to say the least, at the questions that were there, they were certainly very inclusive. One large exception within the questions, I think which is inherent in all of them, but wasn't pointed out specifically, had to do with human capital. And I think, as we've heard today, we must pay greater and, and better attention to our teachers to be and our current teachers in the classroom and understand that we cannot pile on a different way of delivering resources and, and using resources into an old model of instruction. That adds to teacher burdens and it's ineffective. So what I'd like to do in, in my time allotted, as, as I was asked to do, I think, is to look at, the incre at, at OER and K-12 education by looking at the increasing awareness of OER an initiative from the Federal Department of Education, which has been mentioned already, to, and spotlight the efforts in two or three states and conclude with some suggestions that I think Texas could be doing over the next five years. So what is OER? And let me give you a very specific definition from UNESCO and many of the um, other definitions that you will see are, are very similar to this. I won't read the whole thing to you, but I do want to point out that they're in the public domain or introduced with an open license. The nature of these materials means that anyone can legally and freely copy them, they can use them, they can adapt them, and they can reshare them. The OER movement is really part of a, a much broader worldwide open movement that includes open software, open music, open policy across many sectors of the, of the, of the economy. And according to, to Creative Commons, more than 60 governments, including the United States, are currently working on various OER policies at some level. 
The benefits of OER is described in a report from the Council of Chief State School Officers, but you'll see this in the literature everywhere, that they're easy to, they're easy to access, they allow collaboration and sharing among educators, they are low or no cost, allowing in some cases for the repurposing and or shifting of funds. And I want to reiterate that, that free is kind of like a free puppy. It's, um, they're free like a free puppy, that you have to maintain them and things change over time. They often are digital and thus can be brought up to date easily and they're typically licensed so that they can remixed and be remixed and reused and repurposed, allowing for personalization for students. I want to emphasize that anyone can own the instructional materials. The key is how they're licensed. So all, virtually all instructional materials have a copyright license that restricts their use and doesn't allow copying or changing. Materials licensed with a Creative Commons license, thus making them open, not only permits copying, but most of the Creative Commons licenses encourage that behavior. So there's been substantial increase in, in awareness over um, about OER in the last five years. And CCSSO did a survey of the, of the states, and you'll see there's a huge, by looking at that slide, you'll see a lot of states are very inter interested in some aspect of OER. And as was mentioned earlier, the federal government, the U.S. Department of Education, has an, announced an initiative called Go Open that has four components. And I'm not going to comment upon how much money that, that could save. I'm not sure what the algorithm that was mentioned earlier, um, how that came, came about. But the, Go Open has four components. One of them is new rules from the department that would require any new intellectual property developed with grant funds from the department to be openly licensed. And that's something Texas could do as well. Any grant funds that go out to school districts, if, if indeed materials are developed, those could be and possibly should be openly licensed so anyone could use them within the state. A second component has to do with districts whereby 10 districts are pledging to replace at least one textbook with openly licensed OER and within, within the next year, and six districts are already using OER, have pledged to assist the districts in a shift that way. Third component is with the private sector in which Amazon, Edmodo, the Illinois Shared Learning Environment, and Microsoft will provide changes to their respective platforms that will make it easier for educators to create, discover, distribute, curate, and customize and use OER. And finally, fourth, and to me most important, is the Creative Commons and ASCD together will provide ongoing professional development resources to help train educators in the use of these materials. Note that there's no money from the department to do this but it's awareness for folks. Another initiative that's, that's underway is the K-12 OER Collaborative. This is an initiative that's led by a group of 10 states with the goal of creating comprehensive, high-quality OER supporting K-12 mathematics and English language arts that are aligned with state learning standards. And in this case, all 10 states that are involved with this are, are common core states. Um, so, Y'all are not that interested in that, but I did want to bring it up that indeed, <laughs> um, indeed, there are states that are cooperating to make this happen, and so it's a it's an interesting process in that way. They um, so far have are going to build sixth grade mathematics and see where they can go after that. So as the results, I think from the survey from CCSSO, another survey from CETA, CETA, the State Educational Technology Directors Association, and the level of interest in the K-12 OER collaborative show that there is, there's a huge growing interest in open educational resources, and in some cases there's some action. Next, I want to turn to two states that are doing some things with OER that are ta they're taking different approaches. Utah has taken on an OER initiative with a focus on creating free and openly li licensed textbook that supports the Utah core standards. And the first iteration of these materials was for chemistry. And the teachers and some faculty from Brigham Young University use the content that's already available on CK12, which is a platform, um, a, a foundation funded um, organization and platform. And each summer, teams of, of district teachers now meet to update the OER materials, constantly adding new resources, new images, and, and changes based upon the student feedback that these teachers have in their classroom. This is not working with this standard, this particular exercise. We're going to change it to make it better and try this out. So this iterative process is helping those teachers teach those materials much better, I believe. 
According to the Utah State Office of Education, over the past few years, this Open Textbooks project has created materials for science in grades three through eight, as well as earth science, biology, chemistry, and physics. And they've also created materials for English language arts and secondary math. Now, to be clear, these materials initially are pretty simply PDFs as they first started out. As the teachers go back and try to improve these resources every summer, they're adding different things. They're including um, interactive exercise, exercises on, on the web and so on. They're not enormously sophisticated, but they are teacher-created materials. So Utah is focused on this creation and the resultant books have cost about $5 each. And Brigham Young did some research and found that students using the $5 textbooks were just as successful as those using the, the traditional textbooks. And that was the first year. The hope that in, in years after that is that the students will do even better over time based upon the changes that the teachers are able to make in those textbooks. Washington, the state of Washington where I currently live, is, um, has taken a very different approach to OER. There, the legislature passed a bill in 2012 that provides a quarter of a million dollars to the State Department of Education related to developing a, a library of high quality, openly licensed K-12 OER and an associated awareness campaign to let the districts know about them. Their approach is to train teachers first to discover these materials make sure that it's tied to standards, and evaluate these materials against a very tough rubric as well to make sure that they're aligned to well, the Washington State standards of all components of the instructional units as well as the content themselves. They then publish the results of those evaluations for all the people across the state to, to use. Staff have also visited every ES, ESC in the, in the entire state to talk about this and do training sessions about it as well and to help them understand the differences among various licenses. And finally, Washington has also awarded five school districts a total of $90,000 each in OER grants to help support district adaptation and implementation of these materials. And then there's one other state that I want to talk about, and that's Texas. In some ways, Texas is doing a bit of, but of both what Utah and Washington are doing. And let me, let me talk about that. The history of OER in Texas in, uh, in K-12 started in 2009 when Representative Scott Hochberg from Houston introduced House Bill 2428, which called for the commissioner, in short, to set up a process to develop open source textbooks through a competitive bidding process. The bill became Section 31.031 of the Texas Education Code, which I'm sure you, you have seen. It's, pretty, it's permissive. The, the commissioner may do these things. But this last legislative session, Rider 20 to the Appropriations Bill calls for the Commissioner to set aside $5 million from the State Instructional Materials Fund in each fiscal year of the biennium to issue a request for proposals for state-developed open source instructional materials under this section of the code. And it's the intent of the legislature that the request should prioritize advanced secondary courses supporting STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And of course, there are follow-up requirements to report to the legislature and so on about how that happened. And communicating with TEA, I was told that the TEA soon will be posting an RFP for this OER authorized in the rider. So that's the Utah side of what Texas is doing, that is content creation, the just poised to do that. Texas has also created Project Share, as I, I'm sure most of you know, to create a library of resources that are freely available to educators in Texas. Not unlike Washington, but those material differently, those materials are licensed to the state of Texas. They're not open. They're not licensed open. So um, teachers, while they can use them for free, um, that's all that they can do. So Project Share has a much needed focus on professional development. And it's something that we've not seen very much of in, in other states as well. So kudos and hats off. Finally, some recommendations. And most of these recommendations have, have, have been mentioned already. And the first one has to do with flexibility. Well, Texas has made a, a number of changes in legislation over the past two sessions, Senate Bill 6 certainly, in particular to provide districts with more flexibility in how they use instructional material dollars while at the same time diminishing some of those dollars. It seems to me that it's time to examine or create alternative business models for the creation, acquisition, and use of instructional materials. We heard this before. Your question about bundling touches on this, I think. Well, not every teacher is either prepared to or has the time to create an entire curriculum and all the materials for a course. Many do want to use pieces of a wider variety of materials to personalize learning for their students. 
yet we really don't have a clear business model either at the state or at the school district level or do publishers have an easy business model in order to um, to really make this happen and this is not unlike the music industry in which we used to buy albums all the time now we can buy single songs and I think that's was as I listen to, t to teachers and and educators around the country what I hear is flexibility, modularization of content. I want that capability to do that. And yet it's difficult to do. Second, my understanding of Project Share is that not only the materials are licensed by TEA, um, that only materials licensed by TEA are allowed to exist in there. If y'all were to open up Project Share to teacher created materials that are lightly curated and openly licensed, that's going to allow teachers to learn from each other and collaborate more across the state and possibly better fulfill the, the name of Project Share. And third, I would encourage, and we've heard this mentioned already, providing incentives for publishers of all kinds to tag the resources in a matter consistent with the Learning Resources Metadata Initiative to ease the discovery and use of those materials. Finally, and we've heard this a lot today, and I just want to just pile on, you can't use digital content if you don't have access to it. The flexibility in the instructional materials allotment allows for purchase of technology and professional development is good, but bandwidth is a problem that must be addressed in Texas, not only for education, but also for economic development. If a town in rural Texas does not have adequate bandwidth, their chances of attracting any new business is diminished if not destroyed. So robust bandwidth is an economic imperative, and for education, it's a moral imperative. Students with limited or no access to the internet in school and at home provides a new connotation to the already unconstitutional notion of separate but equal. These students are truly separated from the rest of the world and their lack of access to, to content creates an enormous gap in equality and education for them. Thank you. Richard. Hello everybody, I'd like to thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. If the, there we, oh, here we go. Uh, so I'm Rich, uh, Richard Barron from Rice University, and I'm here representing uh, OpenStax, uh, a Rice-based, uh, Rice University-based initiative that aims to replace traditional textbook with exceptionally low-cost adaptive courseware to make education both more affordable and also deliver improved learning outcomes. Uh, I've personally have been working in the open education space for the last 16 years, uh, building various technology platforms to support the development and distribution of open educational resources. But four years ago, I became increasingly alarmed by the rapidly rising cost uh, of educational materials. Just to illustrate my point, uh, this is the growth over the last roughly 40 years of four key sectors of the economy. At the bottom is the consumer price index. Next up, uh, prices of new homes, uh, medical care, and at the very top is the growth in price of education educational materials, textbooks. Uh, the era of the $400 textbook is here, uh, and this is an, an increasingly large component of the $1.2 trillion and growing uh, student debt uh, in this country. Uh, we became increasingly concerned about, uh, as the previous spoke, uh, speaker mentioned, the uh, yaw, uh, increasing gap between the haves and the have-nots in education, and we realized that in order to try to do something about this, we needed to pivot from just working working on technology to also developing content. And so we launched uh, OpenStax uh, College with the aid of a number of philanthropic foundations. We approached them to underwrite the development of a library of 25 uh, free and open uh, textbooks, uh, uh, focusing initially on the college space. Uh, these books are professionally developed, uh, carefully peer-reviewed, and uh, developed to align to the standards of uh, scope and sequence standards of uh, 25 of the highest impact introductory college courses, uh, but then they're made uh, available completely free uh, digitally and at extremely low cost in print. Uh, for example, $400 for a physics, uh, $40 rather, $40 for a print physics textbook instead of a $400. 
Uh, we've been very excited about the uptake uh, of our materials over the last uh, three years. Uh, 2,300 courses nationwide at 1,300 institutions uh, are using our textbooks. Just to put this in perspective, one in five degree-granting institutions across the country is using at least one of our OpenStax textbooks. Uh, since inception, 650,000 students have saved about $63 million using our books. We're very, uh, we and our foundation partners are very excited about this because this is four times the investment uh, in uh, developing those books. And so you could just imagine how that leverage is going to grow, uh, is going to grow uh, over time. Uh, so just zooming in on, on Texas, 52% uh, of the degree granting institutions in Texas uh, are using one of our textbooks. And uh, the reason why I think I'm invited here today is because there's a, a, a lot of uh, interest and uh, uh, uptake in the high school space uh, in Texas in, on an informal uh, basis uh, to teach advanced placement courses and uh, uh, some high school courses around the around the state, and so we're very bullish about the opportunities uh, for. Uh, Texas high school teachers and, and students with this uh, model. A couple quick notes about sustainability. The books were developed uh, using foundation funding. They're, they're going to be sustained long term by working in partnership with uh, the for-profit and non-profit sector. We work very closely with an ecosystem of 40 different companies uh, as uh, uh, for-profits and non-profits who provide value-added services around our books, uh, computer based homework systems, learning analytic systems, tutoring systems. Uh, and what these companies do, they, they really play two important roles. The first is they help market our materials and tell instructors around the country uh, about them. And also when they actually sell uh, one of these services that's wrapped around one of our books, they share uh, uh, funds back with Rice, back with the project in order to sustain the project uh, long term. So this is just a quick snapshot of, of the progress on uh, overcoming this access gap uh, that, we, uh, that we have identified. But the, the ultimate uh, goal is to address the myriad uh, learning challenges uh, that face uh, students, not just in, in, in uh, college, but in uh, K through 12. And a, a common theme of uh, the speakers today has been about the opportunities afforded by uh, uh, educational technologies. Uh, and in particular, uh, the fact that with, with uh, educational technologies like digitized uh, learning materials, we can follow a student as they navigate through their uh, learning or educational explorations uh, in order to uh, use that data to close the learning feedback loop so that students can actually know where they stand in a class, what, they're under, what they've demonstrated uh, understanding of and, and what they, they have not, so that teachers know exactly what are the right remediation or enrichment opportunities for each individual student in real time in their class so that parents feel uh, are, are actually involved in the learning process on a day-to-day -day basis and so that administrators can make data-driven uh, informed decisions about uh, teaching uh, and learning. And it, it just so happens that my day job at Rice is as a machine learning uh, researcher. And so a lot of our work at Rice over the last five years has been to build uh, what are called machine learning algorithms that process this data uh, from student learning uh, 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 interactions in order to close this learning feedback loop. You could think that these uh, algorithms are, are similar to the kind of algorithms that Amazon and Netflix and Google use to recommend books and movies and web pages, but they're, they're really quite different. It's very important to keep in mind that there's that student minds are in this feedback loop. And we have to build in the, the latest results and understanding from cognitive science, the science of learning, into these algorithms so that we can optimize the, the, and maximize the learning opportunities uh, for students. So just to give you an a, a, a example, quick snapshot example of the kind of tools we're developing, uh, rather than giving, uh, uh, telling Susan at the end of the, uh, end of the year that she received a B in her 
course, uh, what we can actually do is automatically organize all the content that is in her course, all of the various learning assets and assessments, and, and tell Susan and her teacher and her parents which are the areas that are greenlit, that, that she's understanding, but which are the areas that she really needs to, to focus on, in yellow and red, for example, uh, where she might do some remedial work so that she will get an A or an A-plus in this course and be well, uh, 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 well prepared to uh, go on to her, her next course. Uh, so we're really excited about the, the opportunities afforded by this. Since we're based at a, a, a major research university, we have a large research program funded by the National Science Foundation and, and other uh, uh, foundations to conduct research into what works and what doesn't work in, in personalized learning. And just to give you an example of one experiment in, in college that we ran uh, at Rice, we found that students who were using these OpenStax tools that had cognitive science and machine learning built in, in an engineering course at Rice, uh, it, this is a real course, this is not a laboratory experiment, they performed at a level that was basically between one half and one GPA point better than students doing standard practice homework. So this is really a significant uh, learning gain and we're excited about the opportunities uh, as we expand uh, to our other uh, learning, uh, uh, learning uh, uh, materials. So just to conclude, uh, we're very excited about not just uh, providing free and open access to learning materials and the, uh, uh, the closing this access gap and also saving taxpayers uh, significant amounts of, of money. Uh, we're not just excited about uh, providing students with personalized learning outcomes. What we're really excited about is beyond this, closing all of these additional feedback loops, uh, allowing parents to become much more a part of the learning uh, data day learning process, giving uh, administrators the data that they need to make informed decisions uh, about implementation and about uh, uh, technology and learning choices, and finally conduct foundational research so that we can really understand uh, what works and what doesn't work in education so that we can make it better uh, for all uh, nationwide and worldwide. Thank you. Earl. Um, Thank you uh, for inviting me, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Um, and I'm really very pleased to be able to talk to you today about OER. And it's because of Rich that I'm here today, actually, this guy sitting next to me. I, I saw something on, the, on YouTube about six years ago, and I learned about uh, open source software and open source learning and became very intrigued. And today, I am the director of the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning at the University of Texas. So could I have, oh, here we go. So uh, CORAL, that's how I'm pronouncing it. You may pronounce it any way you, you like. It's a crazy acronym. Uh, it stands, as I said, for the Center for OER and Language Learning. And so I'm going to narrow the focus a little bit. I'm going to talk about foreign languages. Um, you've just heard about, uh, Rich was talking a little bit about STEM. Uh, so foreign languages is a much smaller ecology. Um, I'm also here to represent the LRCs and the federal government because CORAL is um, part of the Department of Education. The language resource centers, there are 16 foreign language resource centers, and we were established by the Congress uh, in 1990. We're all across the country, and we are right now in our current, our, our second year of our funding cycle. Um, and basically our mandate is to improve the capacity to teach and learn foreign languages effectively in the United States. So that's a huge, huge job. Uh, how do we do that? Well, our mission is broken down into these bullet points here. We undertake applied linguistic research, so we want to understand how people are using these materials to learn foreign languages. Very importantly, we create OER, and we create OER with teachers and students. Um, we also produce assessment uh, instruments, so how do people learn a foreign language? How can we assess that better? Very importantly, we also have workshops, webinars. We conduct a lot of professional development with teachers to help them understand what an OER is, what is intellectual property rights in this new ecology. That's incredibly important. Also very important for our mandate is uh, less commonly taught languages because that's not profitable for commercial publishers to teach. And this is one of the reasons why the federal government is funding us in order to make materials to teach Persian, to teach Arabic, to teach Korean for obvious security reasons. I put uh, K through 12 initiatives in red because that's what we're talking about today, but we do many other things besides K through 12. And finally, outreach and dissemination. 
So here's a quick glance. Um, we are all across the United States from the East Coast to the West Coast, including Hawaii. Um, and we're right in the middle, so we have a lot of territory to cover uh, here in Texas. We're, very, we're a newbie. Um, some of these, as I said, we were established, the, the grant, the congressional grant was established in 1990, but we are only four years old. So um, real quickly, I just showed you in this, uh, in, in this slide, they are primarily at Research One institutions, Georgetown, Penn State, Minnesota, Oregon, uh, Michigan State, Texas, Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia State, um, Hawaii, and UCLA. So basically, our mission to narrow it down even more is to create high quality but inexpensive, sometimes free OER for foreign language learning. But more importantly, I would say is to also promote an, the value system that goes behind OER and to teach uh, teachers about what that means. Um, uh, I describe it as an in, creating an infrastructure for sharing materials among teachers and among students and among parents. That's very important. So. Um, I'm a French professor, and in Romance languages, there is a distinction between the word free has two senses. Of course, most people think, wow, that means free as in no money, that's gratis. But actually, we talk about it in terms of free as a free speech, uh, as a right. So open education is fundamentally about opening up access to people who are often shut out of the, of the system. And this is a great quote from Wiley and Green, uh, two leaders in the open ed movement. Education is first and foremost an enterprise of sharing. If there's no sharing going on, if I'm not sharing my, my knowledge with you, you're not learning. So what we mean exactly by uh, OER at Coral is free access. All of our materials are available online, no password, no fees. But we also want to build them to enable what David Wiley, who's a well-known proponent of op open education, calls the five R's. These are rights then that are bundled in copyright. You have the right to retain the copy. You have the right to reuse it. You have the, that means make a, uh, a copy verbatim. That, that right, by the way, is broken almost every day by teachers when they take, they, they take something, they make a copy, right, for their students. They found a great lesson they want to use in their classroom. But it's not just for them, they want to distribute it, so they violate the next uh, right is redistribute. Uh, revise and remix is really where the game is played in open educational resources. Um, this is, uh, I brought you a, a newsletter. This is hot off the press, Coral Newsletter, and we have an uh, interview with David Wiley. And he talks about the remix hypothesis, so going back the really the big impact for OER is in the last two, the revise and remix, when people can start to take uh, an idea and remix it to appropriate it and make it to make it to adapt it to their classroom. So our design strategies are broken down into these bullet points. All of our content is very modular. We use embeddable media so that they can quickly take take things apart. If they only want to use uh, a video, that's fine with us. They don't have to use the rest of the textbook. Um, we also produce things in edible format. And finally, our surveys show that they want everything. They want print, they want digital, they want it on, all, uh, on every kind of possible, possible way to get the material they want it. So let me really give you, I think it's important to give you uh, a couple of examples rather than talk in generalities. This is SPINTEX, which stands for Spanish in Texas. This is an OER. So it's not a textbook. OER is a very heterogeneous category. It can be something as small and granular as a lesson plan. It can be something as big as an entire course. This is actually a corpus, or what I would say a video archive. And it was the, started as a research project by two U University of Texas professors in sociolinguistics who trained graduate students to go around the state of Texas and to conduct interviews. This is actually a very serious research project with a million word corpus and we're conducting, we're doing computational linguistics on it. But what we did at Coral is we took the corpus and we, we, we uh, sat down with a group of high school te Texas Spanish teachers and said, how would you use this? So we redesigned the corpus using the categories that teachers understood for their classrooms. So if you see up there at the very top, it says lesson ideas, that's the very important point. Teachers are teaching each other how to use this incredible resource. Uh, here's another kind of OER, uh, because again, we said print is not going away, so here's a textbook. 
and Rich was just talking about the savings uh, uh, associated with OER. We adopted, we, this is a, a Francais Interactif, which is a French textbook used at the University of Texas and many other, text, uh, many other institutions. So a college textbook or a first year textbook, but it's also used all over the country in high schools. We instituted this in 2006 and we have saved $1 million at the University of Texas, our students just in French alone. Again, a typical first year French textbook, uh, commercial published, uh, would be about uh, $250. So this is not just a print-on-demand textbook for $30. This is actually an entire website. And uh, so it lots of content that uh, is actually multimedia, so audio and video. And all of this is downloadable. All the print parts, all the, all the different media parts are downloadable, as you can see at the, in the left-hand column to the very, at the very bottom. Um, the National Teacher of the Year is a French teacher at, uh, Col in Colorado. Her name is Tony Tyson. She uses Francais Interactif. And I asked her, why do you use this, Tony? And she said, well, our, our parents, going back to what was said earlier, our parents actually like having complete access to all the materials. And many of them, since the textbook only cost $30, they actually buy the textbook for their families. Here's another very different OER. Uh, this is called eComma, and essentially what this does is create a space on the internet where you can upload a text, any kind of text, a digital text. Um, it can be a print text that you digitize, and you have your students read along with you. So earlier there was a very important question raised about the, the effects of literacy. Um, we are studying then the idea of how does this change literacy when you are reading online, and there are huge cognitive effects. So I could talk about that if we're interested in, in going into that a little bit more. So I'm going to jump since my time is out, but here, here is the last uh, example, the literary and the everyday. This was a textbook, actually materials that were created by a, a professor at Cornell University and shared now through Coral. But it also exists as a, as a uh, Google Docs, so they're entirely editable. And my last slide here is of our workshop. So this is a picture, actually, of a workshop that we did just um, you know, a half a mile away. So there are about 50 people, high school teachers, in the room talking about how to take apart our materials and remake them. So I've also given you a little, I've got, I have lots of toys for you to play with. I also ha will leave you with a flash drive here. It has a little bit of a sampler, essentially, of our different OER. Thank you. Perfect. Members, any questions for OER? Okay, the question that I have has got to do with um, how do we know that you've got, you know, what what the publishers provided to traditionally what we've done in content. You know, they've got a very extensive process of review, you know, peer review and uh, expertise hired and all of that sort of thing. I mean, how do, how do we look at that for OER content? I'm not sure why it's any different for OER than, than it would be for, for the publisher's content. They can, I think they could go through the same process and be uh, compared against the, the same kind of, of rubric that uh, your evaluators use right now. So if it if it's goes through that official process, then, then it goes through that process and, and stands the same, the same test, if, if indeed it goes through that process. Rich? So uh, in the uh, just OpenStax as an example, we invest significant hundreds of thousands of dollars per book. Uh, the books are written by faculty and professional authors from around the country, and we follow the exact same best practices of careful editing, peer review, and classroom testing that the publishers that the publishers also do. And in Utah, they go through a similar process as well. They and they test those those uh, materials out in the classrooms. Okay. So I, and I'd just like to add, too, that I gave this as an example, this particular OER. This has an editorial board of about 30 different people from the, around the United States. So, yeah, I, I think the best practices, we can adopt those kinds of practices from the commercial uh, print industry. Now, how does it work with, the, you know, we were talking about the privacy concerns and all of that kind of stuff, because I noticed you had, uh, Richard, you had a bunch of those um, learning management systems and things where you, you know, are, are working with platforms. I mean, what are you requiring of them in order to do your content? So, so 
our ecosystem partners are primarily working with us on the content side, so they're ingesting our content, for example, into their learning management, their computer-based homework system, for example. Uh, and so they uh, are handling the privacy. They're basically ensuring that their system pr preserves the privacy of, of the students. Okay, but that's not something that you're like saying to them, here's what our expectations on privacy before we want you to use this material. So we, we expect them to follow the industry best practices again around privacy, but, but there, there's no question that this issue of student, student data and student privacy is, is something that needs to be very carefully uh, organized by not just for profit, not just non profits, but, but for profit companies. And I, think I don't know if you guys heard the pledge that was read, read to us earlier in the day. Um, they went through, you know, many companies have signed on to that and that sort of thing. So I, 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 it's just such a big issue that, uh, you know, it's something that can't be uh, looked over. The other thing is accessibility. Um, I, you know, how, how are you dealing with that with OER? Because that, that's very expensive. Uh, process that the traditional publishers, of course, and people who traditionally provide content have to take care of is making sure their materials are accessible. Yeah. So we, uh, from a platform perspective, uh, we have uh, the, the OpenStax platform, we have taken great pains to make sure that our content is, is a, as accessible as possible. And we're very fortunate that we standardized very early on, uh, more than a decade ago, in, on XML, which has become HTML5 type markup, which uh, gives us a lot of control and flexibility to make the content accessible, uh, but that's, that's a very important issue. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you oh, very I much. Have, have oh, did you? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. Ms. Cargo. Okay. Um, so um, I guess this time. So, Richard, about OpenStax, I know you showed the slide, I think, of the high school teachers coming for the training, and I assume some of those were, were AP teachers, but you also said that um, some teachers are using the courses, you just said for high school courses, but they, they are college level textbooks, right? Exactly. And okay. I think it was Carl who showed the high school teachers. Oh, sorry. Okay. So. Right. And the example that I gave of the National Teacher of the Year in, in Foreign Languages is a high school teacher in Colorado, okay. and she uses the textbook, yes. Okay, so... So it's, it is a first-year textbook, um, right. and that's, that's, that's true. We put it online, and people are then using it in different, many different ways. So, the, the, so you've written the books for college level, so then that takes out the TEKS or Common Core. You're not writing to either of those set of state standards. Correct. Well, I was Are trying you? to give you just simply a sample of the different kinds of things that we offer. And again, again, our purview is K through 16, so the mandate from the federal government is do everything and do it for the entire nation. So we have a little bit of everything. If you, we, have, we have OER in 18 different languages, and that's my point. I was trying to show that the, the concept of an OER is very heterogeneous as a group. So it's not just textbooks. It can be, as I was actually trying to show, it can be supplements to a textbook. So what we're focusing on is taking, let's say, a curriculum that you would find and turbocharging it with all these wonderful materials. So I, I can see a partnership, actually, between what we do as a federal agency and then commercial publishers. Because, you know, just thinking as far as review, um, you know, the board process is such that it's, you know, K-12 textbooks that are put through the review, but you are addressing some of those, but which is why I was trying to delineate if it was for college age or not. So I guess if high school teachers come in and they're not AP teachers, then it's up to them and their district to figure out if the TEKS are covered or whatever. You don't do any of them. So we're just starting that, actually. And you're right. The, for the Spanish materials, it's, we, we are working now with uh, Texas AP Spanish teachers. And they're trying to align our materials around the national curriculum. So that work is just now beginning. Yeah, that college board, that's their own curriculum that they follow. Um, right. Yeah, which is different. But the, 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 the media content can be repurposed. It can be, it can be an excellent piece of media used for a college classroom, but also for, let's say, AP. Do I have time to add something, or are we out of time? Yeah, we are out of time. Out of time. It, it, did, did one of you have a really quick question? Just a real quick. Erica, or? I did. The, uh, uh, Jeff, you mentioned the, uh, the, the Go Open initiative. Right. Yes. Uh, has it been adopted? Well, it's, uh, it, it's an initiative that the Department of Education has launched. Okay. So it's, it's 
it's just starting right now. Just part of the grant writing process. Right. Their 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 grant grant process. Well, there's no there's there's no grant process. There's no money. They're they're just they're encouraging the use of of open education resources is what okay. they're doing, and they and they have different mechanisms to do that. The one thing that is still uh, they're writing rules right now for anyone who gets gets a grant from the Department of Education, and they create materials. Those materials are to be licensed as open. Okay, got gotcha. exactly. Okay. All right, thank you. I had a question. Can I ask a question? Yeah, I know, but you got to go. <laughs> move on, move on. Okay. Get a kind of guy. So is that a no? Yeah, we unfortunately can't get every all I'll the follow questions up. in. But Thanks. definitely get them offline over here. Uh, if you want to go back and talk to them about that, would be great. Um, okay. Oh, yes, if you want to leave those. Yeah, Terry will. That'd be great. Okay, we've got one more. Uh, and then we do break. We're cutting into our break here right now. But I know Jackie. She's efficient. <laughs> she's got ten minutes. She deserves all ten. 